So I'm here at the Ignite 2016 in Atlanta, and finally we have uh, the release of Windows Server 2016. And I have with me my Hyper-V rockstar, Ben Armstrong. Pleasure to talk to you again. Our last interview is was at Ignite 2015. Yeah, yeah, one year ago uh, we just released the technical preview three. Yeah, and uh, it's really good to you know have Windows Server 2016 coming out. Really looking forward to seeing people play with it and see what they do. Um, for me, this is like part of the, the best part of developing software. Yeah. So um, it was actually one and a half year ago. So yeah. it was yeah. May 2015. Yeah. So they, you have had some new features we didn't know about yes. then. And yeah. uh, we want to talk about the new stuff. Uh, ben, what's, what is new in Hyper-V? Uh, uh, or what did you add the last one and a half year? So first, before I get into that, a little bit of a story behind this, because it was actually a lot of fun uh, preparing for Ignite this year. So last year at Ignite, I did my What's New In in Windows Server TP3. Mm -hmm. um, and what we actually did was uh, uh, we, you know, of course, the, the you know, show got recorded and you know, the PowerPoint slides were available online. But uh, all my demos, I now build them automated with uh, PowerShell. And we've actually started checking those demo build scripts into our team GitHub account. So you can actually go and check out how I built those demos. Going to be doing the same thing again this year. But That's it was really great. fun because when I got ready for this event, I actually started by going, I'm just going to pull down my slides from last year and my demo script from last year, and I'm going to see what's different. Um, and that was actually really cool because it gave me a really good feel of like, oh wow, like there's there's all this this new stuff that's come out. You know, the first big one that was like, oh, thank goodness, um, is that we now have nested virtualization. I, I you know, I love nested virtualization, but let me uh, do a quick plug. Uh, I will uh, put your session uh, in the video because it was really a great one. I enjoyed it a lot, and fun, you fun session to do, and we had. We had uh, 2,400 people come and uh, see that session. It was great. So you said nested virtualization. Yes. I love this feature because I'm a consultant I, and, and I have to set up a lot of stuff and play with it. But yes. this is maybe not the main reason you invented nested virtualization. And what, what is nested oh, virtualization? Sorry, we should probably say what it is. Yeah, what is so, it? so nested virtualization is the, abil uh, the ability to run Hyper-V inside of Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. Um, which is really great, and that was one of the first things I spotted when I looked at my old script. Because when I came out to do to demonstrate the features uh, last year, I had to bring two laptops with a crossover yeah. cable yeah. and so on. This year, I was able to just bring out one laptop, and yeah. you're right; it is absolutely awesome uh, for trying out new features and trying out new scenarios. You know, I love that in the space of a couple of hours on my laptop in a coffee shop. I've been able to stand up like a four-node hyperconverged, uh, you know, Windows Server 2016 cluster and just play with it. Yeah. Um, and that that's really cool. But you know, you are right. That's not the main reason why we we did all this work. The main reason why we did all this work um, is because we got a request from Azure, and they want to use nested virtualizations to allow customers to run Hyper-V containers uh, in Azure, which of course will be running on top of Hyper-V virtual machines. Uh, and the reason why this is important to mention is I often get people looking at nested virtualization and going like, is this going to be supported or is this some crazy exactly. experiment? I know it's absolutely supported. Um, so yeah. And I must confess the performance is great, right? It is fantastic. I, I'm really happy about that. Uh, the, you know, most people are just amazed when they, they see the performance. Um, now, it, it varies depending, now there absolutely is a performance impact. Yeah, of course. Um, and it varies depending on what you're doing and it varies on the workload. For instance, we have very, very little performance impact on CPU, more on storage, even more on networking. But to give people kind of a, a rough feel, um, so I have a nice shiny laptop and it's got some SSD hard drives in it. And I actually made an unattended installation ISO which will install full Windows Server, and when it's done, just shut down. And I did that so I could benchmark installing Windows in a mm -hmm. VM. You know, and that's something you do fairly frequently. So when I did that just directly on my laptop, mm -hmm. 
took about seven minutes on average. Okay. When I did that nested, same piece of hardware, just an extra layer of Hyper-V in there, it took nine minutes. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the sort of performance overhead. And that's not much. It's less than 25% I was it's saying. It's really not much. Now one of my, and there's, there's, so, there's so many cool little tips and tricks that you can do once you, you know, start playing with this. You know, we've talked about it, it makes it easy to set up and play with clusters and mm -hmm. so on. One of my favorite tricks, which I use very heavily in my demos, uh, is if I, uh, if I set up uh, a nested Hyper-V environment and I put a bunch of virtual machines in there, yeah. I can actually go in and do a virtual machine checkpoint on the Hyper-V host. Oh, that's great. And it captures all the virtual machines at exactly the same point in time and if I'm doing a demo over and over again, I roll back to that checkpoint and everything is exactly where it used to be. Another uh, nice thing is it's included in Hyper-V for client. Yes, and, and in fact, this is really fun because this is uh, the first time I've been able to do this is I did my What's New in Windows Server 2016 session using Windows 10. You know, I had Hyper-V, I had Windows 10, and I had an entire, I had a domain controller, I had scale up file server, I had a Hyper-V cluster, I had a couple of standalone Hyper-V servers, all running on the Windows 10 Anniversary Update Edition. So I really love this feature, you know that, yes. and uh, we asked for it quite for a time, and yep. you said all of you want it, <laughs> but... Uh, yes, right, the yeah. Hyper-V MVPs have been begging for it for ages. We've been saying we want it, but we've been saying we, we, we can't justify the work. And so when Azure came to us and was like, we want this, we're like, yes! yes. <laughs> so, which other features uh, are, uh, are new uh, after TP3? So, uh, kind of not a new scenario, but an area where we've done a lot of work has been around the whole VM security. Yeah. Um, so, in TP3 was the first time that we talked about shielded virtual machines mm -hmm. and the ability to have a virtual TPM uh, for uh, a virtual machine. Um, now, we've continued to do a whole bunch of investment in there, and a lot of it's really subtle. Um, so, for instance, something that I didn't say on stage is between TP3 and RTM, we've actually substantially upped the complexity of the encryption that we use to protect your shielded virtual machine. Okay. Um, so, with Windows Server 2016 RTM, we're actually using SHA-256 to encrypt and protect uh, all your environments. So, very high grade of encryption and very strong protection. Um, we've also done a whole bunch of usability uh, tuning, and this is the sort of thing that you don't see when I'm on stage. Uh, I'm super proud of the team, but like when I was demonstrating Shielded Virtual Machine on Windows Server 2016 TP3, in order to set that up, it was 20 lines of Arcane PowerShell, and I didn't understand what half of it meant. Uh, for our, what I demonstrated on the RTM of Windows Server 2016, it was check a checkbox, yeah. done. Uh, so we, we've done a lot of usability work, uh, but on top of that, two extra things that we've added in, both of which I think are really important. The first one is we're, we're perfect, no, the shielded virtual machine, the virtual TPM, that is all tied to generation yeah. two virtual machines. But we're now also providing a solution for generation one virtual machines. You showed that in your yeah. in your demo, yeah? Yeah, and this is the key storage drive. Now, I do have to be very clear, it doesn't provide the same security guarantees of VTPM shielded virtual machine, but it does provide a way for people with generation one virtual machines to use BitLocker and get you know, basic data protection at rest. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something else, it's in the virtual machine if you have 2016, uh, I don't know exactly the name, it's but... The, it's the credential guard feature. Yeah. Now this, I love this feature. This is, to me, like, uh, when we worked on this and when we announced this, I thought that this was amazing. So uh, Credential Guard is a feature that we first shipped in Windows 10 Enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is, forget about virtual machines for a moment. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get back to them. Yeah. But without using virtual machines, we said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to load the Hyper-V hypervisor uh, on your Windows 10 Enterprise computer. And then we are going to use that hypervisor to provide the ultimate level of isolation and protection for your credentials that are stored in memory. Yeah. And what we were actually able to achieve, and we've demonstrated this on stage, is we can take a credential guard protected box 
and have someone install malicious software running as local administrator and it still can't steal your secrets. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing, you know, because that's the sort of thing which honestly, you know, six, seven years ago, you know, you would talk to any security expert and you would say, can you protect against local admin? Yeah. And they would say, no, yeah. no. If someone gets local admin on your box, game over. You know, and the fact that we're able to come in and go like, actually, yeah, we can protect. Like, we can, you know, construct the system and use this technology. And it really does put us in a situation where Windows 10 is the most malware resistant operating system out there. Uh, so what we actually announced, there were two things I announced. The first one is that that same credential guard technology is available on all editions of Windows Server 2016. So even if you don't use Hyper-V, please turn on credential guard. You know, it is, it is so worth it, you know, uh, because while I wish that no server would ever get malware on it, it happens. It uh, happens a lot. And it happens a lot. And, you know, so being able to, and one of the biggest challenges is when you find a server that's got malware on it, you then have to ask yourself, like, obviously I need to flatten this box, yeah. but did they get my credentials? Like, do I have, like, can I trust any of my servers yeah. now? With Credential Guard, we can say, no, they didn't get your credentials. But the next thing I announced was, we are also allowing you to use Credential Guard inside a virtual machine. Yeah. That I remember, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that is really cool, and if you think about you know, people who are doing VDI farms or once again, server workloads inside of virtual machines. Now you can take advantage of that hypervisor protection of your credentials inside these virtual machines. Very cool. So you did a, a lot of security work. Yes. Windows in general, the Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, there is a lot of security. There's another feature you maybe want to mention with the nice PowerShell Direct thing, huh? Yes, actually. So we, did, so we released PowerShell Direct uh, in the original Windows 10 release, and it was in the Windows Server TP3 release, and uh, people loved it. Yeah, you know, I and, love it. And if you're not aware, PowerShell Direct is where we allow you to just open up a PowerShell window and say, enter PS session dash VM name, and we give you the full PowerShell capabilities uh, inside the, the virtual machine. Um, and it's just, it's so nice for automation, for scripting, for coding. Um, and we've actually been, we've been getting a lot of feedback. We've been making a lot of tweaks and changes. Um, I actually talked about one of them on stage. I'm gonna talk about four of them okay. uh, right here. Because uh, a lot of these are very kind of nerdy and, and in the weeds. The one I talked about on stage is that you can now use PowerShell Direct to a JEA endpoint. And this is really interesting when you look at a hoster environment. You know, because there's always this friction between Tenants don't want hosters to have admin access to their VMs, but they do want hosters to be able to support them. Yeah. And so now a hoster can create a JEA profile that you know, gives them access to things like just the networking command list, but not the file system and not other command lists. The tenant can load that in their virtual machine, and now you have a situation where the tenant can protect the things they want to protect, yeah. but still get support from the hoster when they need them. That's great. And job. that's really powerful. But a couple other things. Uh, the first one um, is when we first released PowerShell Direct, we had a couple of people complaining that uh, we, you couldn't use PowerShell Direct to do things that required administrative access inside the virtual machine, like installing software. Okay. Um, that has been fixed. Oh, um, cool. So now when you connect to a virtual machine, you do have to provide credentials. Um, now, if you're if you're like if you use the same credentials in say, both places, it just works. But if you now if you connect and provide administrative credentials, you can do things like install software, so on. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing we had a big ask around copying files in and out, um, yeah. and you can now do that over PowerShell Direct. Um, so you can do copy item, source, destination, to session, and use PowerShell Direct. And the final thing is we've also added support for persistent sessions, PowerShell sessions. Okay, cool. So if you're doing a lot of PowerShell scripting, rather than having to constantly connect and disconnect and so on, at the top of your script you can go, you know, new session, VM name this, 
store that in a variable, and then just hand that in and use the same session. It's very handy for scripting environments. Yeah, it is, it, especially if you automate uh, yep. something. Uh, I think you use it, but I did a PowerShell script where I set up a storage spaces direct for VMs. Uh, with you had some nice uh, work done with unattended files yep. in your demo. Yep. I, 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 I steal that and use it, and then I set up the VMs and go into the VM and set up the cluster in one script. That's amazing. So uh, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go like really low level nerdy for a moment. Okay. Do so it. I apologize. You might want to trim out this bit. No. Hang <laughs> in for the ride, people. Uh, <laughs> so after this event, I'm gonna be putting up my script for my demo build environment. Um, I had so much fun going crazy with PowerShell on this because I discovered a fantastic trick in PowerShell and PowerShell sessions, which allows you with just two lines of code to take all, a whole set of function definitions from the global scope and recreate them in a remote scope. Oh, that's cool. That's and so, cool. And it's, it's, real, it's not well documented, but it's really <laughs> cool. And so what I actually do in my script is I have a couple of functions that I use for just building out virtual machines. And what I do is I build out my first layer of virtual machines, half of them are nested hosts. I then use PowerShell Direct and pull all my functions across, and I use the same code to create my nested guests that I actually use to create their hosts. I need that. I had the problem because yeah, then you had to, I have, Solved it that way. I had the the functions again in the part that is uh, yeah. so. Uh, so I'm, I'm able to use the same function whenever I create a VM, whether I'm doing it at the host, whether I'm doing it in a nested environment. I'm using the same function. It is really cool. That's cool. So uh, do you, do you remember something else we could talk about? Is there another feature? Absolutely. It there's, is. There's, there's there's always more features. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, when, uh, when we were talking about TP3, another feature which we had in TP3 but we refined a lot um, is the storage class. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was discussing that in TP3, uh, we had the group policies, we had the maximums, we didn't have the reserves working. Um, that was on the list. We now have reserves, so you can go and provide guarantees. You can provide SLAs. Something that I wanted to demo on stage with, uh, with storage class but I just did not have enough time. I was, out of time I, right? I was like, we went like two minutes over, yeah. um, and I, I had a bunch of demos where I was like, we'll see how we're going, and when I got to the storage demo, I was like, we're gonna have to go through this quickly. So I would have loved to have showed this, but you know, one, of the, one of the interesting, there, there are two interesting problems actually we've seen in the space of storage costs. Um, the first one is most people don't really understand their storage bandwidth needs. They just don't. It's, yeah. it's, it's a new problem. They are not used to thinking about it. The second one is the classic, people only start looking for the answer once they realize there's a problem. Yeah. Um, and so to help with both of these, we've introduced a new commandlet um, that you'll run on your scale up file server. Um, and it's really cool. It's get storage cost float. And what, cool, yeah. what get storage cross flow does is it just shows you all the I.O. that's coming in and out of all the VHDX files on that server. So when you want to understand what's going on, you can go see that. And you can see at a high level, oh, like here's what my VMs are doing. But even better than that, all that infrastructure is turned on by default. Mm. So if you have a problem, you don't have to go and enable it and wait for the problem. You can just go to your file server, get storage cost flow, and see all the data. Um, really so cool, yeah. that's something that's new in the final release. Um, so that's uh, we're really happy to have that, and it makes it a lot easier to, to set up. The other thing on storage, and this is both storage and graphics, is the discrete device assignment. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, and so this is this is we now have the ability to take a, a PCIe device. Um, and pass it through directly to a virtual machine. And the two, uh, two scenarios we're looking at is people with uh, high-end graphics requirements, you can pass through GPUs, um, or people with just you know, the ultra-high storage requirements. And I mean, just, just at this event, uh, on, the, on the first day before I did my session, uh, I'm, at, I'm at my booth, and I have someone who comes by, and they're they're discussing their their environment, 
And they start saying like, and we have a couple of these database workloads which are really I.O. intensive, and we have some dedicated systems for them, and we've got Fusion I.O. cards in them, and I'm sitting there grinning and going, let me tell you about what you're going to do with those systems in 2016. That's great, yeah. You know, and you know, once I explained that like, you're going to be able to take those Fusion I.O. cards, pass them thr through to the virtual machine, have zero virtualization overhead on your storage path, you know, you could see the eyes light up. Uh, on the on the GPU side of things, uh, more investments there. Uh, we've done a bunch of investments in remote effects, yeah. uh, and it is better than ever. You know, we've got you know increased OpenGL support. We've got increased performance across the board. We've got a whole bunch of scenarios that now work that didn't used to work. But you know, remote effects is great for if you've got a VDI farm and you want to give good 3D experience to a, a large set of users. Um, but we all know that there are those users, you know, the architects, the, the power users, where you know, they need to have a dedicated, you know, best GPU experience possible. And we now allow you to use discrete device assignment to take a GPU and pass it through. Um, and let me tell you, we actually have, there is a, there is a preview available in Azure yeah. today that is using this technology to give you GPU-enabled virtual machines. And uh, I have actually sat down and got one of these virtual machines. Thankfully, I didn't have to pay for it because they're quite expensive. <laughs> um, you pay top dollar for them. But, uh, this, but keep in mind, this is Azure. This is public cloud. I was able to get a virtual machine, run uh, like a, a top-of-the-line recent 3D gaming benchmark in an Azure virtual machine and get 100 frames per second. That's great. Uh, I, I know yeah, you yeah. are you are playing a little bit with games. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but you know, you being able to, and uh, that's the sort of thing where it's like, you know, like three, four years ago, if I'd said to you, Casting, hey, soon you'll be able to uh, run high-end 3D graphics at 100 frames per second in a public cloud virtual machine, would you have believed me? Yeah. No. I wouldn't have believed me. <laughs> Another use case is, of course, for number crunching. Yeah, you ab also absolutely. Yeah, and we have uh, full support for all the, like, for the, the CUDA and the other number crunching algorithms and, and stuff that's out there. Yeah, so it's if, for example, someone has to do a large, um, like, fini I don't know the English word, finite elemente uh, for in, uh, in the automotive industry. Yep. You have to uh, do a lot of uh, calculations. Yep. You can do that in Azure now. Yep. And even, that's great. So great features. Do you have one last to add? Because I'm, I'm, I'm getting nervous about my, the space on my camera, you know? <laughs> So, so I have one last one. This is new from TP3. Um, you know, this is not really a Hyper-V. It's kind of it's a semi-Hyper-V feature, but okay. I'm going to sneak it in there uh, because we weren't discussing this in TP3, and I, it's taken a lot of work to pull it off, and I'm super proud to see it, is that we now have the ability to run Hyper-V containers natively on Windows 10. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. So that is that is really cool. That took a bunch of work from a bunch of teams. Uh, but now if you want to play with Windows containers uh, on your Windows 10 laptop, thanks to the power of Hyper-V, we can start up a Hyper-V container, run Nano Server in there. Oh, and that reminds me, Nano Server Nano improvements. Nano Server, yeah. And I, I showed this on stage. We now have, I, I, I can keep on going. We now have, uh, we have a lot more diagnosability and support for Hyper-V on the native Nano Server mm -hmm. console. One of the big pieces of feedback we got from people was like, yes, we get Nano Server. Yes, we get that it's very minimal, headless, yada, yada, yada. But please give me a way to just do a sanity check on my virtual machines at the console. So that's there now. Right? Yeah. Even on Nano Server console, you can go in. It'll, if it's a Hyper-V host, we'll, you can see your VMs. You can see how much resource they're using, see their uptime. Um, so that's, that's another new one, yeah, too. And, uh, I, I was just in a container session uh, with Taylor. And with Docker, great work there. It's also, yeah, the Hyper-V team absolutely. is also yeah, involved absolutely. in containers yeah. a lot, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, one little part So, story. we had to take another place because my camera roll was full. We, I mentioned that to you in the video, but yeah. you were going on with I'm nice sorry. features. So, uh, you were telling me uh, a nice thing, a parting thing about uh, your notebook. Can you explain us what happened there? Yes, I was saying that uh, one of the things that uh, I'm particularly proud of with all the new features in Windows Server 2016. I'm well known on the team 
for just playing with everything and maxing out my systems. And uh, with the benefits of things like, you know, nested virtualization and so on, uh, I've actually been able to melt the plastic over the exhaust vent on my notebook from running it so hot. And that's that's a mark of pride for me. I think we're doing nice our job. The one you have with yeah, the, the, the brand new one that Microsoft paid thousands of dollars for. Yeah, I, I melted the case. <laughs> okay, this is quite a thing. Another thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, you have some new numbers with Windows Server 2016 and Hyper-V, of course. Yes. Uh, they are amazing. They are really huge. And yeah, I, I don't think many people will need them now, but maybe... Yeah, Maybe so, later. So the the, no, the scale numbers we have is, uh, and it's just, it's like, you know, another, we did this in 2012. We did like a 3x, 4x yeah. improvement in scale. It's another 3x, 4x. We've gone from 64 four virtual processors and one terabyte per virtual machine yeah. to 240 virtual processors and 12 terabytes on the physical hardware. We're supporting up to 512 logical processors yeah. and up to 24 terabytes. And uh, one of the things that I always like to call out is these aren't imaginary fictitious numbers. We have tested Hyper-V at this scale and we know it performs and performs well at this scale. So um, many people will say that these numbers are crazy. You will never need that. There's no customer for that. But there is actually, but, but right? There, there is. And in fact, the, the main reason why we went to these scale numbers was because we're working with Azure right now to allow them to offer these massive virtual machines. Because have you ever priced out the hardware for that scale point? No, no. It's, 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 it's a little bit expensive. I, I um, it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it turns out that the price of the computer doesn't scale linearly yeah. with, the, with the size and so on. But, and so we talked to customers where they have you know, a, a, a period of time where for a couple of months they need to run a massive workload and it's really hard because they don't want to go out and buy one of these amazingly huge systems when they just have a short-term need. Yeah. And so what we want to provide through Azure is we want to provide the ability to basically rent a supercomputer. Yeah. You know, so if you need something for a six-month project, you know, then okay, fine, just pay for that six months. And then when you're done, you don't have a supercomputer sitting around in your backyard. I think this is really valid and maybe in one year or two years you need more. There are things yep. like uh, in-memory databases, yep. SQL is great there, so yep. there is a huge demand for memory and a VM, I would yeah, say. So ben, I'm really excited thanks so much for the interview and yep. for the nice work. I love it, you know. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to cool stuff we do in the future. I I'm actually am. <laughs>